Um, this work, uh, um, some of this uh, so, several we've seen, so I may go through a little quickly, but don't hesitate to stop me or ask questions. Um, and uh, um, so the first half of stuff that I've been doing to, um, with some models, and the second half is um, work that I've been doing with my graduate student, uh, Samantha Wallace. Uh, so first thing I'll do is give brief introductions to the uh, two models that I've been involved in, uh, the Air Force Data Summative Photospheric Flux Transport Model, or ADAPT. Um, this is the model that um, I helped get funding for, but Carl Henney's basically done all the heavy lifting, and he's taken that over since I've left the Air Force Research Lab. And, I'll, and then also the, uh, the Wang Shili RG model, or WSA model. I'll give overviews of that. And then I'm going to basically talk about different applications of these uh, together. So one is the, just the uh, issues impacting the ability of, of those models, and really any kind of like uh, photospheric and chrono model to, to predict and slow wind model, predict the solar wind accurately um, and to forecast. And then also issues um, that are kind of a long, it's a well-known problem, but at least by a small part of the community about um, inconsistencies in the open flux and uh, as estimated by the um, chronal models and uh, in situ observations. And then some work we're doing with magnetic expansion factor, what role it exactly plays and in particular, in this case, in inside pseudo streamers, because there's been some questions about that. All right. So uh, now, just to start off, this probably, um, depending on the audience, I go into more or less detail. But one is the the photospheric magnetic fields uh, is a key driver to. I wonder if I can. They said this would work. Look at that. Uh, is a key driver to uh, basically all chrono and solar wind models. There are a few that maybe uses uh, other input, but the, the major models use uh, uh, photospheric magnetic fields like this. And the standard approach has been to look at the sun every day and take an observation and, and put it together, just stitch it together, kind of you know along central meridian. And you get a time history, as, Carl, as um, Jack Harvey put, a uh, time history of central meridian, which is great, but it's not really what you want. What you want is an, you want the sun as it is now, or you want a synchronic map. And this has got all the issues that the sun, as it rotates, evolves, things emerge, and so forth, differential rotation. And so this was the motivation for uh, developing what is called the ADAPT model. And, and so the goal where is to, is to basically try to create synchronic or instantaneous maps. And that is, uh, you know, basically take observations when you have them, but then also evolve the flux using well-known processes that happen on the sun which are like differential rotation, and I'll, I'll go through a couple more of things. And then assimilate rigorously, real data assimilation, as you get new observations. And this is a five month um, uh, movie of the sun, and you can see this data assimilation window right here as you're assimilating. And so the goal here is to provide instantaneous or synchronic maps of the global magnetic field, because ideally that should produce better observations. Of course, we have the problem that you can't see the far side of the sun, Hopefully, Solar Orbiter will solve that. And just to get due credit, it's mostly been funded by the Air Force, and there's been collaborators with NSO and Los Alamos, and a little bit of funding from NASA. Um, so uh, the DAT model itself, it's, it's a flux transfer model, and there's several models like that. Mark DeRose and, and Jim Healy actually did it. But one of the unique things about it is, is that this does real data, this does proper data simulation. Now, what it does take into account are things like the differential rotation, uh, the meridional flows that drag flux up to the poles, and things like supergranule diffusion. And, and that's actually done um, statistically because you can't, we don't know where the supergranules are, especially on the far side of the sun. I mean, some people could say we know where they are now, but we simulate that data, so we're, they're there. So we don't need to put them in there, if, but it's on the far side where we really need to do that work. And then we use a variety of uh, data simulation methodologies, which I'm not going to go into, um, more or less sophisticated. And the, the thing to, about ADAPT is an ensemble model. So it doesn't produce one um, snapshot of the sun at one moment in time. It actually produces a spread of, it pr produces an ensemble of solutions. And that, whole, ideally, if you do that right, it actually represents the spread, the, basically the range of uncertainty in our, our knowledge of the, what the photospheric field distribution is for doing it right. And so this right here is not a movie in time, but it's actually what the sun could look like according to the model, the 12 different realizations. 
Uh, here's a recent data simulation window. The, this is where the sun happened to split both the left and right edges. This is the far side, and you see there's all that jumping around. That's basically, we just don't know exactly what's going on. And, um, and you'll see how this impacts the solutions. And uh, so the WSA model, most people know about this. It's, it's, one, of, you know, it's one of the simpler models. It's, it's a potential field-based type model. It's a composite of uh, a potential field model then uh, interlinked with uh, the Shat and current sheet model. And the goal there is to actually pull out the field out to, you know, further out in the space. It, it actually helps to, um, it's used to, it, this is actually used to drive more advanced models like, you know, LFM uh, Helio or what's now called Gamera. Um, Enlil, um, and so forth. So you start with a map like this, and this would be, for instance, an adapt map, but you could put 12 solutions in there, and that's the inner boundary condition, and what, what it does is provide the global magnetic field solution. And so the outputs are the magnetic field at any height that you want. If you, fit, if you trace the field lines down, it'll identify where the coronal holes are, these colored regions. And this right here, this dark and light gray, it's just po negative and positive polarity. It's just this map converted to plus and minuses. All right, so uh, this, the model identifies where the coronal holes are. And then if you look right here, it actually, these, these crosses are the sub-Earth track. It's the track that connecting the sun to the Earth. So when it flows out radially. So on a given day, let's say, you know, April or February 5th, the model is telling it the solar wind came from this coronal hole. And then if you use an empirical relationship, because we don't right now understand completely how the solar wind's accelerated, although models are moving towards that direction, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this part, uh, you can get the global magnet, you can get the global solar wind at some outer boundary, and this right here. So this outer boundary, if you take this and this, is actually a driver to Enlil, to LFM Helio, to all several different models, even my simple 1D kinematic model, that uh, just runs really quick and gives me a good first estimate of what's going on. Um, let's see. Uh, so it's based on two things, and, and um, this has been going on for years, but the, the originally started with Wang in Chile, and uh, what Wang, back basically in 1990, um, was able to discover was that there was this relationship between expansion factor and solar wind, as I'll mention later, whether that's a physical relationship or a proxy is still in question, but it's something that worked and that actually what led to this model actually being made operational because you, you, you were able to predict solar wind speed. What a magnetic expansion factor is, is just the rate that the, as the field goes up, it expands and if you, as, as compared to one over R squared. So if you expand more than one over R squared, you have an expansion factor greater than one. If you expand at the rate of one over R squared, then it's one. And uh, this was, um, um, then used by Wang and Shealy to produce predict solar wind speed. They actually would, would, actually in the past, what they would do is they just would do bins of solar wind expansion factor, you know, from one to five and five to 20 and so forth. And I just, one of the papers, I just, I, I, I made it basically so we could operationalize it, just came with this little <laughs> empirical formula. Well, that um, worked okay, uh, and I won't get into too many details. Uh, the, 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 the let me, before I go on to the next thing, uh, what it basically says is this is the sun and this is a, like a coronal hole and these are the fields expanding. It says that the wind, you can see right here if we go back, that when the expansion factor is small, you get fast wind, you know, small divided in there, you get a large number and the bigger expansion factor is the smaller the solar wind speed. And um, physically, the, the idea was that the field expands here a little and uh, or less, and you get fast wind here, and at the boundaries you get slow wind, and that that was the idea. And uh, there was a, a reasonable correlation but, uh, that Wang found. Um, actually, I had trouble getting the speeds exactly right, especially at the poles. It, it was under predicting, and uh, um, P. Riley was using uh, the distance, the coronal hole boundary distance. So if you were in this, like right there in this flux tube. I mean, in this coronal hole, he would calculate the minimum distance to that boundary. And the deeper you're in, you're in, the faster the speed. What I found to make the model work well, I, I did a little study. And what I found is that uh, if you combine expansion factor and coronal hole boundary distance, it, it worked well. You can see up here in the coronal holes, you get fast wind. And then at the boundaries, you get slow wind. Um, we were getting too slow a speed, at least I was. 
and these boundaries. And if you look at it, it's really just that empirical relationship I just showed you with this modification factor. And that if, when theta is zero, this is just point 0.2, so it's small. So when you're at the boundary, it's, it's small speed. And then when this is infinity, this goes away, and it's just large. And it's just this gradual transition from slow to fast, depending on how far you are. And then with it being modulated by expansion factor. Part of this talk is going to talk about what we're looking at is like what role does expansion factor really play? And I'll save that for uh, later when I have the appropriate slides to show. Um, that is a dirty little trick, uh, secret about uh, this uh, coupling of the Shatton model and the potential field model is that, um, so you have the potential field model and at its outer boundary, it forces the field to be radial. And it's just a construct the idea is that as the solar wind expands out, it drags the fields out and makes it radial. And uh, the reality is that it becomes radial too quickly. And when Wang and Chile and actually Ken Chanton developed this, um, if the output of the potential field model is input to another potential field model called the Shatton model. It's really just another potential field model. And the problem with it is, is that when you give it BR, the, the model gives you the rest of the components. So at this boundary, we forced it to be radial. So by definition, it's radial. But on the other side of this boundary, you've given a radial condition, then you have components. And so you get these kinks. And so that's uh, disturbing. Um, but uh, actually, when it, like Zorn Mikvich was like, oh, yeah, we know all about that. No big deal. I was, I was nervous because I had a student presenting this at one point, and she got a talk instead of a poster. I thought she was going to get beat up badly, but she didn't. She actually got like a best talk award. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> maybe because we prepared so much. So what, one of the things we were thinking about doing is what we did is we raised the source surface a little bit further out. And instead of driving it with the radial field at the source surface where you have that artificial constraint of BR being radial, we took a radius further inside where things are you know not radial yet, and we used that BR. And it's an artificial construct, but you can see that it produces a much, it mitigates it greatly. And so it's a nice little clean fix to, or improvement, I should say, to this, okay? Um, so just, uh, and, and if you look at the solar, so this was in her paper, Sarah McGregor did the work. This solar wind speed is a function of time for uh, back in 1995. And the blue triangles is the Wang Shuli predictions at Earth. And the black is here is the observations, blue is the model. And you can see we completely missed this, this feature. But when, when we include this, this fix here, the connect, what was happening is we're connecting to the wrong place. And once we fix that, you actually see we capture this string. And so um, you know, this actually can make improvements to the, yeah. No, that, so that's a good question. Um, so we, in this case here in this study in 2008, we just played and, and we found, we looked at a couple periods and you know, this was for a paper and we fiddled with it. We're now going to, we're working with flannel and we're gonna actually investigate this. We're gonna do, do um, um, some optimization over the solar cycle where we're gonna use the output here, this kind of stuff to optimize these radii and also to see if it varies over the solar cycle. And because uh, there's a lot of talk about potentially it does vary over the solar cycle. Um, so just to follow up on that, so if you that picture, is it changing the test height when you, based on where you choose that height? It, it could, right? I mean, can I see the previous? Oh, yeah, sure. Because you're choosing it happening before the source surface. It, it could, it, it'll, we're going to have to experiment with it, but it, it, you know, what happened is she found that it was, for this particular case, that it, she didn't have to twiddle with the distances too much, so we didn't get too far down. But th we need to investigate it over the solar cycle and, and to ans answer questions like what you're, address questions like you're, what you're asking. Uh, you have to be a little bit worried because you can start opening flex up that you maybe don't intend to open. Is that where you're going with that? Well, that's yeah. one of the directions. The other okay. direction is it could improve because we know that the 2.5 source surface cusps things at one thing over the entire solar cycle. And there were studies done looking at how changing that would affect the, the, the cusp height. Yeah, yeah. So that, this is, we, we have a, a one year study to, to do this. And uh, um, we're basically doing, uh, building the tools to optimize several things, including this empirical relationship that. Uh, we're, something we'll do later, but we, that if we develop these tools, we can do that. Let's see, so there's this. And uh, so uh, 
I've shown this many, many times, but this is a really good example. Okay, so remember, just to review, ADAPT produces 12 realizations, okay? So what you're seeing here uh, is the map from June 21st, the 12 different possible solutions for June 21st for ADAPT. And then that's been fed into the WSA model. So we get the field up at, in this case, 21 and a half solar radii, and we get the coronal holes at 21 and a half solar radii, radii. And you see there don't seem to be that much of a difference. The, the current sheet's wagging around. The holes are kind of changing. Some of the, well, actually right here, if you look, the connectivity is actually changing quite a bit. And if you see up here, that's basically your one case, you're above, you're cutting uh, through one polarity. In another case, you're above the, the current sheet. In another case, you're below. And that actually makes a big impact because right here, if you look, if you could run through this, let me, let me just start this over real quick so I just make sure things are in, in sequence. Um, you'll see that um, overall we're capturing this well, but right here, here, this is, I'm sorry, I didn't explain. This is the magnetic field polarity. So positive is out away from the sun neg at Earth. Negative is uh, towards the sun at Earth. The black line are observations and the blue line uh, dots are the model. And likewise with velocity, black lines, observations, and, and this is over a rotation of blue dots model. You see, we capture this pretty well, but in some cases, we're completely missing this. Other cases, we're getting it quite well. And, and, and basically, it's bouncing between one of these, these two. And if you just drive, if you were to drive with a variety of different maps, you, one group could get this answer, another group could get that answer. And the reality is the right answer is it's this. It's a positive polarity. That's the right answer. When, when this gets in the sequence, you'll see. And this is pretty quiet time period, but what's going on is um, the only variations in these, this map here is the supergranulation. And that supergranulation, this has been run over 12, 12 different realizations over time. Sometimes more flux gets up in the poles, sometimes less flux gets up in the poles. And that the, the strength of the polar fields will, you know, we don't see the polar fields well. You know, there's periods where we don't see them at all. At the time, we always see them poorly, right? And um, the models are extremely sensitive to the polar field because the dipole moment's the major component and the biggest dipole moment are the polar fields. And so the models, all models, not just potential field models, but MHD models are very sensitive to the polar fields. And, um, and so uh, this is a time history of ADAPT. In fact, the ADAPT model doesn't fill the, it, we don't even use the, the mag magnetic field observations at the poles. When it's adapt, they assimilate out to about 70 degrees from the center of the sun, and they let the flux transport process fill the poles. And we start with one seed map. This works, all the credit goes to Carl Henney. Uh, we start with a seed map right here in, in 2003. Uh, the the uh, blue dots are observations from Mount Wilson for the, the South Pole and the North Pole are the red dots. And the model adapt. We start with one seed map, and you can see that it's just flux transported. We don't play with the poles after that, and you can see it tracks for over a decade well. Um, but if you look more closely, that period that I did where you, you, the, it was predicting the, the polarity, and sometimes it, you know, it was predicting the solar wind well, and other times, you can see that it actually varies by upwards of maybe up to a gauss at the poles. And that's, that's a big fraction of five. That's 20% uncertainty. And that's what's producing this fluctuation. And um, we don't have, um, th so this is an advantage of ADAPT because we can play with the polar fields and actually, you know, we basically will have 12 different or more realizations. We can identify which map produces the best results. Um, but the, this right here shows you that it's very sensitive to the polar fields. These solid lines are the different, like four examples of the realizations of the 12 and just gives you an idea of the spread. Uh, this is why, so yeah, go ahead. Got all these different cases, yeah. you can identify the one that looks does better, which is the truth. But, you know, it's well, five to some extent. Yeah, right. With solar wind data, two yeah, days later. Right. But at that point, point, it's already reached you. Right. So how are you going to use it to? I mean, you've got an ensemble of solutions, but is there anything else you can do to constrain it before it hits? You? So that, that's a really good question, and uh, um, the, there's good news. Um, so one thing we did is we did. I had a student uh, last uh, it's two summers ago who um, uh, we came up, we, we talked about this metric, but we, we had a maze, way of measuring how well we're doing. And it turns out that one realization uh, will 
typically dominate for a rotation or more. So it's not it's not fluctuating. You know, it's it's you know like tomorrow one one realization today, another one tomorrow. It seems like it stays the same for a long while, and shifts. The other thing is, um, so we can basically, from a practical forecasting, so retrospectively, we can just look and say what the right answer is. From a forecasting standpoint, we can kind of estimate that we know this one particular realization has been doing well, and we can trust more, we, can tr we have greater trust that the, that realization will be good for the next few days. And so we can keep a running tab on that. Um, but we also are looking at things like the coronal field and trying to match that with the model and looking at um, uh, coronal holes and trying to match that. So you use multiple constraints on the model and s hopefully all three will say this realization is best. And, and I'm just a skeptic. It's sometimes, you know, one will do well. But I, um, you, you would think that if you get one parameter right, it'll probably match the other parameters. And, you know, in this case, call me an optimist. Um, but that's what we're going to do and, I, and what, we're gonna, what we're doing. Uh, and it's actually something that's going to be used at um, NOAA. All right. On this example many times, but what we've been doing is using HMI vector data. So historically, we've used line of sight maps. So now we're using BR maps that are directly measured. And um, so what I want to point out is there was a whole thing where I could show you the line of sight and the vector. It turns out the vector seems to do better, not surprising. Um, in active regions, we actually had the direct BR. Um, what I'm going to highlight here is that there's a case here where um, on the far side of the sun, this is, you wouldn't know that by looking, but at the far side of the sun, there was an active region that emerged that, this is a very old data right here. Even though we've evolved it, we don't know what's going on, on the far side of the sun. And, and based on helio seismology and using you know, the stereo EUV, we know an active region merged. So we're gonna share the case without the active region in and a case with the active region put in to show you the difference. And so this is, again, all 12 realizations. And one of the differences here is not only we're using all 12 realizations, but we're updating the model each day with new maps. So there's a lot going on. This is really a sort of a poor person's time-dependent model because we keep updating the um, predictions using new maps every day instead of just pretending this one map for this whole rotation is the, the right answer and, and not changing things. And um, so you can see the polarities. It's reasonably OK. There's some jumping around here. Um, sometimes you cut through a current sheet you're here and you, you can get a lot of flipping back and forth. Um, and um, uh, one thing I would say with the BR map is a little bit noisier with the model. The line of sight was less noisy. Um, but we're capturing it. But now as I go to the next thing, look right here and look at the connectivity when we, we switch to including the active region. So we now have included the active region. I'll go back and forth. S see how that current sheet changes. Now you can see why there's so much flipping back and forth because we're, we're skimming right along these, these, it's now rippled. And you can see that we're, there's many cases where we're actually capturing the structure a lot better. Okay, so now there's a combination of we didn't have the right data on the far side and then the, 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 the sort of the, the different, um, um, as we go through the movies, what that is is the difference in the polar fields. But there's cases where the polar right there, for instance, and there's other cases where we capture that better if you look through it, where we actually capture this, um, this region well. So it, what we're saying is, this is at Earth. It's really, well, so what it says is, you really need to know the full sun. And I mean, that's probably obvious, but th we were actually questioned you know, one, a long time ago, like, do you, maybe you just need the near side to predict the near side. But it actually seems to be global. And if you don't believe me, well, let's look at the uh, impacts of the same active region. Now it's stereo B. So I showed you results here. Now we're going to show you results here at stereo B. And everything's the same. We're just going to make predictions. And in this case, I actually did 36 realizations. Uh, the numbers can creep up onto where you get 144 maps. If you do, it, you can actually produce two, two, uh, 12 maps a day, 12 sets of 12 every day, 144 maps. I mean, it ends up being in thousands. So even though it's a quick running code, it can take days to run. Um, but here's the stereo um, B results. And um, it turns out, if you look at this coronal hole, uh, it's quite, it, uh, you'll, when you compare, you'll see it's big. Uh, these are the polar fields during this time, according to the model. And you see they're oscillating around about a gauss. And that's why you get this oscillation. But you see right here, we're really over, this is it's predicting a much larger hole consistently than observed. OK, but then when we, include the active far side region. This is, you see now, 
We're actually capturing the stream structure way better. And you actually, now you see we're, we're actually, um, a lot of the connectivity is up here and not, this model's not showing that. So the point is, is having, having all the, you know, getting the polar fields right, getting the far side right is really important to getting the global structure right. And, and I've showed you cases at, zero a, at Earth and at a, uh, zero B, um, how that is. And then this is just an ensemble, a, this is just the average. Blue is the average. The, the, blue, the blue lines are the max and min predictions. And the red is the standard deviation. And you can see um, of the ensemble members that we, we really are you know, within the, the uncertainty is capturing the structure. All right. so. Um, now for something, anyways, any questions? Because we're now for something completely different. Yeah. On the far side, you don't really know the polarity. How do you? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you don't, so helioseismology can identify the active regions, and EUV can identify them, but you can't get the polarity. But you can make assumptions. So it's one of the assumptions is you can just assume Hale's law and Joy's law. And you can, you know, Hale's law basically says one polarity dominates in northern hemisphere, another one in southern hemisphere. And you can start with that. Of course, with ADAPT, you can create an ensemble of solutions, and you can end up producing a few examples with it reversed. This is why I want to compare with the coronal, uh, with the uh, white light data, because the streamer structure may change based on that orientation. And we're doing those experiments right now. Um, but um, we have to guess. Um, I'm not personally doing it right now. They identify, but we're we're open to any 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 possibility of getting the uh, information on that is useful. Carl Henney, um, um, Gordon McDonald, and and I are co-authors on. Or Gordon did the work. Uh, he's the first author uh, on you know trying to to specify the flux inside these actor regions. But that's one of the things where uh, having constraints and having some information, we can actually narrow down. What are the realistic pro uh, possibilities? Yeah, it's worth recalling those stereo analysis. Uh, well, I, yeah, I'm not holding my, you know, there, there'll, there will be solar orbiter, I hope. Um, but uh, there, helioseismology has been getting, it's been improving in the ability to identify the regions. So. Yes, is really what. You, well, actually, what is just magnetogra magnetographs all around the sun that would solve the problem right, yeah. right there, and maybe one somehow hovering above the pole. Um, well, then the, the lack of the polar measurement uh, actually isn't that big of a gap if you have the West. Uh, it, it it can because. Um, I'm, I'm saying both will help, um, yeah. um, but the, the poles, you, I, mean, it, I mean, there's periods where you don't even see it. But one of the things is with polar orbiter, what I'm hoping is if, or if, if we can get up there, maybe, and we can get information, maybe we'll be able to predict it better. We're already doing pretty okay, um, but um, we could constrain it more if we understand more what the physical processes are going on. But uh, it'd be kind of nice to have spacecraft that are out of the ecliptic and sort of orbiting uh, so we could do that, but you know, I can dream. Um, well, yeah. That that's right. That's right. So so no, but that that's a really good point. And so one of the things we want to do is we want to study. You know, actually, this is actually make a thank you for stopping because actually with Solar Orbiter. We've been trying to encourage them to get the far side as much as possible, and for as, you know, for several rotations. Because one of the questions we want to do is actually have we want to have like reality, and then we want to see how sensitive the solutions are. And one of the questions, maybe we just need to get eighty percent right most of the time, and we'll be good enough, you know. Or maybe you have to get it, you know, if it's a little bit tilted wrong, it can really mess stuff up. So we're trying to figure out, you know, in what cases are how big does it have to be to be influential. Um, how how much does the flux have to be balanced right, oriented right? To we don't know any of those questions. The sensitivity of the models to all those sort of things. So that's those are all really good questions that we need to um, 
to work on. So I, I, I concur um, quite quite um, strongly with that. Okay, so this is um, uh, work that I was doing with, uh, I've been playing with this for years and my, my, we actually now have a complete draft and we have the reviewers, uh, our, our co-authors looking at it. But there's this known problem of um, the magnetic flux as calculated by models not agreeing with observations. Uh, observations being in situ observations. And I'll explain all this. And since I'm talking to primary solar physicists, I, I don't think I need to explain the difference between open and closed flux, but just, just to remind people that what we do is we, we uh, the, the flux that flows out in the heliosphere, we, we're, we're gonna take the absolute value of that because I mean, it should add up to zero you know, without the sign. And it, that varies over the solar cycle. And the big problem is it's just in the, in the nutshell, it doesn't, is, um, the models are, cannot, do not reproduce it most of the time properly. They can be off by factors of two. And the question is why? So what we thought of doing was, let's try to come up with different ways to estimate the um, polar, the, not the polar flux, the open flux, if I say polar, sorry, but open flux. Let's, let's come up with maybe an independent way of doing it, just to see if it can provide information. And uh, so you can calculate open heliospheric flux based on models or in situ observations. I'm gonna explain both, but it's just uh, to lead into it. Uh, but to show you the problem first, just to get you maybe um, oriented, um, the blue line, this is open unsigned flux in Weber's over 23-ish years. And the blue line is the open flux has based on the WSA model, but you could have used a more advanced model. It, it gives the same answer. And the red line is based on in situ observations spacecraft. And you can see there's, there was a time here back in the 90s where it matched well. In fact, beforehand, the agreement was, way, was a lot better. But here you can see there were discrepancies, though. But you can see it's diverged, and, and especially around solar max, factors of two off. And you know that's disturbing, because you know, the models should be producing these results. And I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of tell you another thing. If you just were to, you know, the, the fields that are driving these models, you know, like with the potential field model, you can multiply two and you could raise the flux up by a factor two, but that's not gonna solve the problem because you would fix this part, but then mess that part up. So it's something more complicated. And I'm not saying I'm gonna be able to answer the question, but we, we have some we, results that are very interesting. So the question is, which is right or, or both wrong? Or And um, so you've seen this, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna use WSA to um, calculate the, the open flux. And it's very simple how you do it. You just basically calculate the chrono holes and then slap these holes on the top of there and add up the flux and you get the number. So you get that. And um, this may be, maybe people are less familiar with this result or maybe they are. So. Um, Ulysses was a spacecraft that was highly inclined out of the orbit. And actually, um, um, so uh, they, they, when, they, when uh, Smith et al. were doing this work, they actually found, like during solar minimum, when they plotted R squared BR, because the spacecraft was you know, changing radius, that the R squared BR value was constant. If you see that, this is positive polarity and negative polarity. That value, independent of latitude, constant and it's right there there's the results and this is true for and when they did solar max it was noisier but it was effectively constant and you know if you put a four pi in there you basically this is a quote from the paper any latitude provides an accurate estimate of total unsigned flux um, so a single point measurement seemed to provide uh, an estimate of the unsigned flux I was originally skeptical of this and said so in a paper but I you know it's kind of hard to argue with this, but um, I would be happy to hear anybody's arguments. Um, but this is what's sort of considered to be ground truth, and and these are the re these are uh, this is what the red line here is results uh, uh, using Omni data is based on using the Smith et al. result. Okay, so they don't agree. You can get you can get open flux based on models and based on in situ observations. And they disagree. So what do you do? Well, one thing we thought, the simple thing we thought is, well, maybe we're, we've been using these traditional input maps. Let's use adapt maps. You know, why not? And the other thing is, why don't we just forget the models altogether and look at chrono hole observations? And you, you know, people have been drawing chrono holes or, or doing that. And we have the, the magnetic fields. And why don't we just directly estimate it, see what we get? And I was actually pretty convinced that we're going to get three different answers, right? 
Um, so, um, so the first thing we did is we used ADAPT, which I've talked about right here. Uh, it provides, you know, basically um, instantaneous maps um, as well as we can. We don't have the far side in it, but it's, it, we attempt to, and it, we attempt to get the, the sun more accurately. And we were using the, the beginning of the rotation, the mid rotation, and the end, rot end period to calculate fluxes. And again, this is work from Samantha, and she probably shouldn't have used yellow, but um, so um, this is the blue is the model, and you can see that the, the and the red, uh, the yellow is the uh, uh, model using um, adapt maps. And you see the overlap's pretty good. There's, there's a little bit of a difference between uh, this is when BSM started, the Solus started, and this is before that. But the agreement's pretty good, a little bit of uh, differences, but not significant, but very much different than this. So that um, doesn't really help. And if you think about it, we're, we're doing three rotation running averages. And so these instantaneous snapshots, if, you know, in hindsight, it's kind of maybe obvious that, you know, why would we expect it really be different? And because we're, you know, at any one moment, the traditional maps and the um, um, adapt maps would, would produce maybe different results, slightly different results, but on timescales of 90 days, probably not. All right, well, so that was the first thing. So the other thing we did is it, uh, Karen Harvey and Frank Reesley for over a decade literally drew chrono holes using 10, 830 every day that was clear out and they have a whole data archive. In fact, we actually went and found their archive, you know, and essentially uh, we checked to make sure we got the same numbers as they did, but we, we actually just used their numbers. We didn't fiddle with it. We, we made sure that we got the same answers. So we digitized all this and so forth and just confirmed that we would get the same answers. But in the end, we just, uh, the results actually, they had calculated the flux and when you, do that, okay, so that's, you know, it's the same way you do with um, WSA is you, you know, these are the observations in this case, uh, not model, but the observations of the chrono holes. And these are the input data. And when, for both cases, we're using the NS data. So one of the controversies that, that other people have brought up is they were using Mount Wilson and Wilcox and combining the two, and we stayed away from that. Same input data for everything, all right? So when we used the DAP to use the same magnetograms that went into the traditional maps NSO generated, and, and so forth. And, and these are the same input maps um, um, for, for all cases. And when you overplot it, um, I mean, th this to me is pretty shocking. Like, uh, um, you know, we, during maximum, we seem to, to miss, our, our interpretation of that is, um, and you guys are more experts than I am, but the uh, uh, helium 10 30 it's hard to, the um, active regions can block the coronal holes. And so we probably are underestimating the flux during maximum. But for a nine year period, it's tracking incredibly well. And this is literally taking data that Karen Harvey had at NSO and just plotting it on there. And so what's that, of course, what it's agreeing with is not this, but with the model. And so what my interpretation is that the model is uh, actually, um, what, what the um, models are producing are saying are chrono holes or what observers are saying are the chrono holes. That's my interpretation. Uh, now, so then um, Samantha came, she's my student. She came several, I've been working with her for years. She came and the first year I tortured her by drawing, she, Rachel Hawk helped her learn how to draw chrono holes. And we had a, in, an engineer who helped also do that. And um, so we had a tool and she spent like a whole summer going blind, you know, wondering why doing this exercise, but I told her it would be worthwhile. So what she did is she, she combined stereo A, B, A and B, one, I think it's 195, with uh, SDO when it was available 193. And those periods, the goal here was to create synchronic EUV maps. So for that time period where there were, um, and, and we, we did a little bit of, um, we, we were able to, at times when there was gaps, we were able to like take different parts of rotations and merge them together. I can explain that more detail if you're curious. But in this case, for instance, you can get a whole map of the sun by merging these data. And she would then literally would spend, you know, hours drawing these chrono holes to identify them. And these were then used to calculate the open flux. And you see it tracks right on there. And you know, and it's like I'm still surprised. So 
Now, we, we didn't have data here because I think Riesley and, and Karen, you know, didn't generate that. And, um, and then stereo started around this time. So, um, but you can see um, the, what, it, what, I'm, and a, what and somebody drawing these holes, what they identify actually agrees well with what the model's predicting. Yeah. So Matt's drawing the outlines of the yeah. field strength, the flux you put through that hole is based on the, based on the photospheric map, which you're also using for the models. Exactly. So the photospheric map is not right. That's right. That's that's right. So um, that's one of the. It's, I'm, yeah. I compl now I told you though, if you just multiply by two, though, you're not going to solve the problem. So it's something more complicated, right? Um, so um, my interpretation is that one, independent of this problem with this, the um, whatever the whatever the models are saying are open is op are coronal holes. That's what observers are seeing on average. Let me emphasize on average because we're doing 90 day. Rotations, but um, that was actually kind of really an interesting. It is an interesting result. Now, there's all sorts of things that could be going on. Um, like Sarah just said, it could be the input maps. You know, when people are saying we're grossly underestimating the flux at the poles, we don't see it well. Maybe that's it, because that would be a difference. Um, maybe there's sources of open flux that aren't dark. I don't know. Um, uh, maybe in active regions. Um, one one of the things that you know these maps are line of sight maps converted to radial. You get the the magnetic flux and the the, the active regions are probably wrong. So maybe we could take what some of those merged maps that NSO is now creating. That's line of sight outside of active regions and um, radial in the active regions. Also, all these models are time. They're steady state. It's they're producing a stationary result. You know, and the question is. Is, are there time defend effects going on? Maybe something's going on that we're just not capturing. So that could be with the models, that, and that I'm sure you guys can think of others. In situ, um, one of the explanations that people have put out, Matt Owens, Pete Riley, is that it's CMEs, that the active region, CMEs are going out and they don't detach, and the spacecraft don't, don't know any better, so they add all this extra flux in. And Matt did this paper where he assumed that they detach after a certain um, time period, you could you could you could um, explain this. Um, the other thing was, oops, sorry, I told you I had to move around. So the um, the other thing is, um, I, I still wonder about the observations because it turns out that the um, BR, which is what you want, drops off as one over R squared, but B tangent drops off as one over R. So as you get further out, that tangential component becomes greater and greater. What if that's wagging, it, it is wagging around. What if it's wagging around and, and, the, and the, ops, the, the instruments are measuring that though, and it's, is, is it overestimating BR? Could that be the problem? So I need to talk to some of the people that do that. So that's some of our, so we didn't solve the problem, but I think we've constrained it more and, um, um, and so uh, that's an interesting result. That paper, I hope, will come out in the next. Uh, we're going to submit it soon. All right. So the last. Go ahead. Your last point. I, mean, I do agree about the CME animation, but that last point, the Parker spiral is at a very different angle than Ulysses was. Well, this isn't Ulysses. This would be like a. Oh, no, I'm just I'm going back to the uh, Smith result. I assume they. Is there a new one? Um. I'm not sure what they did. In fact, I haven't told you this part, but actually, so I thought well, Ulysses would be the most incredible thing to, to use to get um, the flex because it's out of the ecliptic, it's, so it's far away, and it, it varies. And the results are, the further away you get, the flex gets, the, the deviations get huge. So I do think there's an instrumental effect going on. I can show you that plot later on. Um, but what Matt Owen showed is that within one, a, within one AU, all the spacecraft give the same answer. I'm not saying the answer is the right answer, but it gives you the same answer. So it's, this is a little bit more complicated of topic, and uh, I'd be happy to chat about that. But let, with the last 10 minutes or so, let me just show the last set of work we're doing. Um, so uh, anyway, so problems with the, was F, FFS is the uh, expansion factor. And so th this isn't necessarily so recent, but Pete Riley, I'm actually a co-author of, I think, this paper here. Um, he, 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 he's the one who invented the idea of, of calculating so density based on how far inside a coronal hole you are. 
And so he's very dubious of the expansion factor. And so he, he wrote a paper sort of trying, basically using, for instance, it's pseudo streamers. So here's a pseudo streamer. Where's my mouse? Okay. Um, pseudo streamers are two polar, are two coronal holes uh, with the same polarity. And what happens is they want to spread out like that where they have slow wind. But when you have two stream, two polar hole, two coronal holes, I'm sorry, that um, have the same polarity, uh, they'd start expanding out, but then they're forced to go uh, this, to um, basically um, basically change their, their, stop that spreading. And so technically what happens is you get a small expansion factor here. And so, and just I got to emphasize, we're testing the Wang and Shealy approach for the forecasting. Wang and Shealy has actually argued like, oh, it, you, they have like arguments for why you shouldn't, you know, you should use at different heights for these. And I'm not going to get into all that, but my thing was to test this. And um, so um, what we decided, a number, what happens here, this suggests that um, the solar wind emerging from pseudo streamers, if you took the Wang and Shelley approach literally, small expansion factor, right at this cusp, you should have fast wind. And that's probably wrong because at the boundaries, you have slow wind coming out. And, um, but, you know, so people are dubious, Pete was dubious, but I asked him, I said, do you actually have spacecraft fly through the one in that paper? He goes, no. And I said, well, why don't we just, why don't we just get a whole bunch of pseudo streamers and test it? And then we can just answer the question definitively one way or the other. I mean, you mean published a paper with three different examples and somebody else had a few different examples. Let's just do a statistical study and answer the question. Uh, right here? Yeah, because yeah, what happens is it's streaming from here and goes around and, and it streams out. Um, and actually, and so, uh, yeah, so you have that. So uh, anyway, there's been, for as long as I've been involved in this, uh, there's been questions about whether expansion factor is merely a proxy. It just, you know, it so happens that at the coronal hole boundaries where the slow wind is, it happens to be spreading a lot and just happens to be a correlation, but not physical. There's no physical mechanism. If you talk to Steve Hammer, though, he would say it is physical and that there, it's, a, it's a, real, uh, a real thing. So the, there's been this, this debate. And so one thing we're doing is, uh, and I, I, when I was co-author with Pete, I made him tone down a little bit about the expansion factor because I said, we need to investigate this more. And so one thing we looked at is, well, let's do the pseudo streamers first. Well, let's stay away. The next thing that uh, Samantha is going to be doing is we're going to get away from the boundaries and look deep in cyclone holes and then look. And I'm not going to represent those results, but we're just going to talk about the pseudo streamer results. And what she did is, uh, she looked for uh, as many pseudo streamers as possible that spacecraft um, pass through. We we're magnetically connected to using ACE and stereo A and B. And then she performed, basically we calculate expansion factors at the streamers. And then we looked at the observed solar wind at Earth and um, said, what is, what is the observed speed? That's really the study. Um, it's a little more, it's all, you know, it sounds simple, but it's always the devil's in the details. So she went through numerous, numerous observations, uh, our model runs. <laughs> And um, this is an example in 2007 where you have this, this coronal hole and this coronal hole. They have the same polarity and you produce a pseudo streamer. Uh, I'll show you a, a, a fill line image of it so you, you believe me. Um, but what she did is spent a whole bunch of time identifying when spacecraft passed through these were magnetically connected to it. And then she identified periods, uh, the solar wind that matched. And it's like, well, how did we do that? Well, what we... What we did is we, we, took, we took the uh, ADAPT model and we ran multiple realizations. And so we, we knew the spacecraft passed through. And then what we did is we did a model run, 12 model runs. Uh, this is the black as observations, blue as the model. And uh, we, know the we know when the solar, solar wind left the stream, pseudo streamer. Um, that's, we can just, based on this. And then what we did is we made, we, we found those, solutions where it agreed with observations pretty well. So we kind of knew the whole goal here was to find out when, about when, using the model, about when did that solar wind arrive? And then we looked at the real observed solar wind. So we used the model um, to, to estimate within a plus or minus a, day, a half a day or a whole day's time is that so, to identify that solar wind parcel. Because, you know, if, if it turned out that the, the model mo predicted up here, then you know that to be really off. So we, um, people have questioned that approach, but 
we basically said if the model's predicting the, the solar wind arrival time properly, it's agreeing with observations, it's, there's a good bet within about half a day that we're, we're right. And uh, so this is the pseudo, yeah, this, this is the pseudo streamer. This is the North Pole, and that's that little active region. And, and um, um, what happens is we actually um, trace a lot of fill lines, one right at the this, this sub Earth point, but also above and below. So there's a lot of fill lines here. But this is the this, this pseudo streamer here. And the nice thing about WSA is that we actually trace the parcels out as they're literally the individual particles. And so we tag with those particles, where did they come from before they left? So we know where they emerged from, what the latitude and longitudes of the source regions are. And we can tell, we can attach to that parcel the expansion factors, the magnetic field, and they just all propagate out with them as individual little particles. And so we know exactly where, when we look at this, this part, this, this um, dot here, we know exactly where it came from and what its expansion factor was. So that's a, an advantage to the model. And so Samantha plotted the last field line on each side of the pseudo streamer. She, so um, I'm sorry, I went, actually, this is kind of good. I did it anyway. She plotted that one and that one. Let's see if I go back. So this is a plot of solar wind speed as a function of expansion factor. And you can see that, I mean, there's like 70 some odd values here and the correlation is really low. It's statistically insignificant. Um, the, the colors here, actually, we were wondering why there was this tail here. And it turns out um, the color goes with magnetic field strength. So these over here are actually rooted in active regions. Okay. And uh, so what happens is if you have, uh, this is an example right here where you have strong active region. This is a pseudo streamer. You can see the field lines coming out from the pseudo streamer. And the weak field, it turns out if th th this example here, the field in here was, and at this resolution was some 200 Gauss, and this was 10-ish Gauss, you, you can see one is going to dominate, and it's going to have a bigger expansion factor. So we just think this is just like a topological effect. And um, um, so when we move, when we stay out of active regions, just as um, you can see that there's no correlation whatsoever. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that means expansion factor is wrong. And I would argue, no, 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 no. At, you know, the, 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 there's a slow solar wind and the fast wind. And the, the mechanisms, which we don't fully understand, accelerating the slow solar wind is, could be very different from the fast wind. Fast wind comes from open fields that are sort of continuously open. Slow solar wind probably comes at, this is right at the boundary too, where you have maybe um, 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 a lot of reconnection going on and interchange reconnection. And it's like, you know, expansion factor play no, may play no role in the way the slow solar winds uh, um, driving is, is occurring. So it's, I was telling Samantha, I said, why should we assume the expansion factor would play a role there anyway? Because you have opening and closed field. It could be just puffs of, 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 of solar wind just you know going out and has nothing to do with expansion factor. We're going to look deeper inside a cornhole where we're away from the boundaries and look. Um, but right here, we don't think that there's um, um, any, any correlation that expansion factor plays a role. Uh, we looked at the strong field regions. There's a, a weak correlation here. It's, I think it's the probability of this correlation being significant is about 5%. So you're on that ragged edge of believability. So we, we maybe we'll add some more um, pseudo streamers here to get the statistics a little better. Um, so I think, okay, good. Timing's right. Talked about the ADAPT model. It's used to uh, drive models. Actually, not just solar wind, but Actually, F10.7 in EUV, which I haven't talked about, but this stuff that Carl does. Talked about the wang Shili model and its applications. Uh, talked about this open flux problem and possible explanations. And um, we investigated the role that um, expansion factor plays in pseudo streamers. And uh, we have identified 37 pseudo streamers so far at, that are connected to, the, to a spacecraft. And, um, it may not be that, like at the boundary, that at the, the, the boundary that the FS, the expansion factor velocity rate is wrong. It's just not applicable there. We just don't know. And that's it. Thanks. All right. A couple minutes left for questions. Sarah. Can you go back to the picture of the pseudo streamers. Um, I'll say these dots that go and the one with the field lines. Okay, that one. Maybe. Yeah. Um, is it possible? But the place where the expansion factor is a diagnostic of solar wind speed, um, 
for normal normal streamers and right. normal holes, um, it kind of behaves in a constantly expanding way from surface to the source surface or wherever you measure it. Whereas, of course, as you know, with the pseudo streamer, it does this funny kind of refocus. Right, right, right. If you were to measure your expansion factor lower down before the refocusing, would you get a correlation, for instance? Um, we should check, and people have suggested that. So that's, that's in fact, I, I make sure I do credit. I think that people like Wang and Chile and, and uh, Marco Valli have suggested that. And that's our argument why it's not wrong, you know, because I think what Wang and Chile, what Yi Ming has basically argued is it, you shouldn't measure it there. You should measure it lower. It's not right. So, um, and we'll, we should put that, we should look, look at that. So we will. She will. <laughs> You were, sorry. All right. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, can you go back to the reasons why the open flux problem might be? Uh, I think it's A, because um, we, we have a, a grant right now that works on specifically the recalibration from end to end of the GONG magnetograms. And this will apply to all magnetograms, but they're looking, but primarily when you're looking at these open field regions, those are mixed polarity regions. So instrumental effects are Right. Uh, but they have done some preliminary work to show that, oh, Joe's here. Yeah, yeah he could talk to us too. He's going to be yeah. involved. Uh, preliminary work shows that this, this open flux factor decreases a lot when you calibrate the magnetogram correctly. And so mixed polarity regions are still using it. Um, so the exact factor is still something that we're working on. Um, Ho hopefully, the factor. It's not unif It's not the same everywhere. That it depends no, it's on. Yeah. 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 HMI, which also has uh, transverse information, would that wouldn't that help you? With they, they, they uh, no. Yeah, my my understanding is that the the the, the signal is too weak to really. Yeah, they don't What's that? Don't say I the, that the field is too weak there to actually trust the transverse component at the poles. And I've heard people, some people say it's it's super radial. I've Roger Ulrich, I'm just telling you what he said. He actually says it's this way based on his data. But, you know, the, the thing is, that's why I want to look at the polls. Yeah. Well, we're using two different instruments. Uh, well, from the same observatory, at least. But, um, yeah. Uh, you know, but you can see that. Yeah. yeah. So the the thing though is during minimum. I mean, so like dur uh, during the in in the mid lateral coronal holes, I I, I I did some work that I, I should have published that the the flux coming from the mid lateral two coronal holes during like um, maximum is the is flux is like four times what you get from from like polar holes, and so. It wouldn't take a whole lot of a, you know, during maximum to a whole lot of change to get a lot of flux out of active regions during the time when you need it. You know. Assuming. Yeah, you tell, say stop when you. Yeah. Am I going the right way? Yeah. That. Yeah. The blue is the model.
Are you talking about this right here? Or? No, the, the next part and then this, this jump. Uh, the gap. Oh, why is there a gap right here? No, no, no. To the left. No. Yep, right so there, there's a dot right there. Yep, there's, the there's a dot. It's hard to see. There's a nice little dot there. Very steep. Yeah. Now, the, 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 I mean, there's, there's a lot of details in there. One thing is that we're running, we're running these, um, the, these are, we're running this as if there were a Karen, so we're using one map and we're in it as a Carrington map, but we're running it near the time we want, so we're hoping it will reflect the right period. Anyway, um, otherwise things get too complicated. I can go in detail if you guys want. You're saying ballistic map. Ballistic, but the model, um, it's simplistic, uh, but it does take into account stream interaction. So you get steepening and you get the rarefaction. So it's simple, but it, it, there's an example where you just, it, it does produce the steepening that you need. All right, with that, let's thank Nick again.